country is closed early on that Friday. There were fireworks in town. There were big celebrations. Uh, there was the dedication and planting of the trees for the men who had died during World War I uh, at Capron Park. And it was just huge festivities where the baseball game was going to kind of be the center attraction um, of, of that weekend. Um, and part of the three men who made all of this possible uh, were Harold Sweet, who was one of the first, I think he may have been the first mayor of Attleboro. Anyone can correct me on that? I think he's the first mayor of Attleboro. Uh, Oscar Wolfenden, uh, appropriately enough this week, they're taking down the Wolfenden and Son uh, smokestack uh, downtown. Who's a big sportsman, his favorite thing, he owned a lot of racehorses. Uh, but these are the people who kind of shelled out some money uh, from owning the factories to um, pay for the players to come to Attleboro and Bill Sart, uh, who also owned a precious metals company in town, uh, kind of made this whole celebration possible and shut down their own factories and let their, their workers enjoy uh, the long weekend. So once they decided that they were going to, you know, take out a bunch of their own money and bring in players, uh, they need to find a way to get to them. Um, it's a big league, you know, it was kind of winding down, the playoffs were starting, players were getting ready to go to different areas. Uh, so both teams kind of deputized a player to go out in search of, you know, who is going to come to their team. So John Stuffy McGinnis, who actually was from Gloucester, Mass, was kind of North Attleboro's man for the job. Uh, he had actually already arranged a uh, baseball exposition of mostly uh, his Boston Red Sox teammates, including Babe Ruth, to tour a bunch of cities and towns throughout New England uh, during this time. Uh, so North Attleboro essentially leased that team for game five. Uh, the other one was Dick Rudolph, who was the pitcher for the Boston Braves, and he decided to kind of you know, leverage some of his relationships with his teammates and former teammates and people that he knew that might be interested in playing some games to put together a roster for, uh, for Attleboro. So the starting pitchers that day um, for Attleboro was Carl Mays, um, who I think is a pretty fascinating uh, player from this era. So this was back when you could use a spitball and you could use all different kind of weird tricks to um, get the ball to, to go where you wanted it to. Uh, but with that, and with the fact that players didn't control their pitches very much, he was kind of known as a notorious headhunter. Uh, would throw the ball in pretty close and try to hurt some players. It was a pretty rough and tumble game. Uh, and he and Ty Cobb actually had a few run-ins where Cobb went after him with a bat and uh, they went after each other. And in 1919, the Red Sox went from being kind of a championship franchise that was always successful and started to go downhill. And I guess he was kind of ahead of his time of being kind of a star player who just kind of like pitched a fit. Um, he got upset at some of his teammates for not you know, fielding ground balls that he thought that they should have gotten. Uh, he got upset at fans in when they were playing against the Philadelphia A's on Memorial Day of heckling them, and he went after some people in the crowd and threw a ball at them. Uh, there was an arrest warrant out for him, but he like took off on a train before they could get him. Uh, and he just essentially left the team in the middle of the year and said, I'm not playing for the Red Sox anymore. Uh, so the Red Sox said, okay, we'll, we'll sell you to the Yankees. The Yankees aren't very good anyways. Um, so he was the, one of the first stars of the Red Sox who went off to the Yankees, where he'd soon be joined by Babe Ruth and a host of others that really formed the nucleus of the 1920s Yankees dynasty. Uh, the second one was a member, of the, a pitcher who he would join with the Yankees, Bob Shockey, uh, who also had a very unorthodox delivery. If you look at the history of the time, very few of these pitchers were throwing as hard as they could. It was all about kind of throwing junk balls and being deceptive and having uh, a bunch of different pitches in your lineup. But he was beloved by his teammates on the Yankees. So very kind of a, a contrasting character between Mays and Chalky at the time um, for that day when they met at, at Brady Field. Um, so at this point, the series had been tied. Um, Attleboro had won the first two games to semi-professional players. Uh, North Attleboro had brought in players for game three, and Attleboro kind of wasn't ready for what was coming uh, to them. In game four, the Yankees, I'm oh, sorry, not the Yankees. I just kind of think of them as the enemy of North Attleboro. <laughs> so uh, uh, North Attleboro had, uh, had hired Walter Johnson, uh, who was probably the greatest pitcher of all time in baseball history, certainly was the best of that generation. Uh, and he had just overpowered our Red Sox 
<laughs> Attleboro, Attleboro, Attleboro lineup, um, who had some Red Sox players on it. Um, that just you know wasn't able to be successful. So game five was kind of the crucial uh, deciding contest of who was going to win that 1919 Little World Series, and uh, and North Attleboro just overpowered um, the 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 Attleboro in the end, winning six to three. Um, but kind of the interesting thing was it's unlikely stars. I was going to flip quickly to the next one. Who did this? The person that hit a three-run home run uh, in the eighth inning to win the game was a man named Bobby Roth, who uh, came off the bench and pinch hit for Bob Shockey uh, at the time. He was kind of a minor star at the time. He had some good seasons. Uh, back when not too many players were hitting home runs, he actually led the majors in home runs one year. Um, but to kind of quote some of the Attleboro Sun, it, it was a very creative era of sports journalism. Described as met one on the nose and sent the sphere far over the center field fence, breaking up the game and making a north wind possible in game five, uh, was the way that the Attleboro Sun described it. Um, but although North Attleboro um, won, it seemed like everyone had a great time uh, at the end of the game. So this is kind of the way that the Attleboro Sun described it. So despite the fact that the rivalry had been bitter at times, the fans did share a u nearly universal admiration for their managers Frank Kelly and Danny O'Connell and organizer Bill Sart of Attleboro. As the Attleboro Sun wrote, Sart, the Sart started baseball here, and until the North Series was alone, had it not been for Mr. Sart, the chances that no baseball would have been played this summer while Attleboro fans were solid in their congratulations to manager Frank Kelly and proud of manager O'Connell for getting such a great team of stars together on such short notice. And almost as soon as the last hour was recorded, according to the Attleboro Sun, the fans are already t talking over the prospects of next year and another great series is predicted. Uh, and they were 100% right on that. Uh, the 1919 series really kicked off uh, an enthusiasm for this city and enthusiasm for the players to come to Attleboro, North Attleboro, uh, to cash in on the series. They couldn't